I've said it before and I'm going to say it again. I am going to run out of shelf space and then these book haul videos are going to go away. But that didn't happen in February. Hey, what's up bookworms and book collectors? Mike here with another book haul for you for February of 2020. And while I feel like sometimes these get smaller, not this time, not this time. Uh, I am running out of shelf space. My wife has already told me no more bookshelves. Uh, so I don't think that I'm actually gonna be able to, to whittle my way out of that one. Uh, so <laughs> I don't know if it's gonna get back to, okay, paperbacks maybe can go back into the closet, but I doubt it, I doubt it. I think I'm just going to have to really start thinking about converting to digital only, except for authors I really, really want to collect their works. But it is not this day. Uh, I did get a couple more series. I continued some, and some was just, hey, they have really pretty covers. I'm going to go for that. Uh, let's start up. You guys know right off that I have been doing the Dresden Files, and a question I get a lot is, are you going to do the short story? So, of course, I had to pick those up. Uh, I got both uh, side jobs and briefcases at a half price books for a really good price so i said hey why not even though they are hardcover and i have the whole series of mass market paperback and i like them to match that is what it is you know it's just sometimes it just works out that way sometimes it don't uh, i don't think i'm going to be reading these while i read the dresden files series it's currently on hiatus because my wheel of time schedule had to pick up before jordan con but i plan on getting right back to that because i do have an advanced reader copy of peace talks coming and i'm currently only on deadbeat so i will have, have to be really putting the pedal to the metal there to get through that before that uh that arc shows up but uh what i plan to do is after i finish the series then i'll read these side stories and treat them as prequels or inserts or whatever just because i'm so terrified of people being like oh you can read them now or at this point and then i read it and it talks about something that hasn't happened in any book yet that's what i'm, I'm kind of uh, just worried about so i have no problem reading them kind of you know when these books were released i think that that might be the best idea to 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 read these uh short stories but i mean i like everything that butcher has written that i've read so far about the first six books uh, i've enjoyed all of them so i don't imagine that this will be any different and let's keep moving along here you guys know that i did do that poll on what i should read in 2021 and then the twist of the story was i plan on reading all of them uh in that time over the course of the year but one of the bigger ones the only i think the one that came in second behind malazan was Robin Hobb and the Farseer books. Uh, really just the realm of the elderlings uh, just by themselves. This this version is absolutely beautiful. Uh, if I hadn't gotten that Warbreaker one by, by Brandon Sanderson, I probably think this was like one of the better illustrated books I've ever seen. But man, it is just gorgeous. It really is. And all the art in here is just wonderful. I mean, just look at it. It looks like a fairy tale book. I mean, it's really cool. And I don't know anything about this, this series. I've never read Robin Hobb before, you know, but... Uh, I said, okay, these, I, I believe that these are the first time that these are available in the States in hardcover. So I want to do that. She's, this one's already Assassin's Apprentice is out. And uh, the second book, I'm not exactly sure what it's called. It's, uh, it comes out in June. So uh, yeah, I'll be collecting those as I start Farseer next year and get these beautiful, beautiful copies to, to, to read off of. So um, yeah, Robin Hobb fans have been very, very welcoming. It reminds me a lot of the Will of Time fans when I first got into that and how welcoming they were to me deciding to do that. Not quite to the level of excitement that the Malazan fans were, but, you know, that's that's a whole different... I think, like, Robin Hobb fans and Stephen Erickson fans are going to be quite two different breeds. Uh, but who knows? Who knows? I'm, I'm hoping to become a big fan of both of them. Uh, you guys know that I did do the read-along on the channel. I mentioned on the last book haul that this got lost in the mail. Uh, but apparently the, uh, the the neighbor that got it by accident did come bring it to me. So I actually got bought this in January, but I did get Rage of Dragons, in, uh, you know, this month when it actually made its way to me. I uh, did a review for it recently. I think it's a wonderful book. Very, just an impressive debut novel. So uh, by Evan Winter. And I, I'm very much looking forward to the sequel. I already have it pre-ordered. Can't wait to see it. Uh, he's a very nice guy. He actually reached out on Twitter to tell me thanks for reviewing the book or whatever. And, you know, I was like, hey, great. You know, you think maybe you want to get me an advanced copy of book two? 
<laughs> so I'm trying. I'm trying, guys. I'm always hustling out there trying to get more content for the channel. But uh, definitely check out Rage of Dragons if you haven't. I think it's wonderful. Speaking of wonderful, one of my favorite books of all time is The Hobbit. And I still was going off this old soft cover I got when I was a teenager. And I said, you know what? I got that really beautiful collector's edition of the trilogy. I need to upgrade The Hobbit. And this annotated version, much like Assassin's Apprentice, just has such beautiful artwork in it. Runes. It's, and obviously annotations just to let you know what was what they were what he was thinking while he was writing some of these things. Just it's a brilliant, brilliant copy. I'm trying to find the, the artwork here for you to show you some of the stuff that's in here. It's just it makes it really, really fun to do a reread of a book that I've read, you know, a few dozen times. And I'm reading my kid Harry Potter right now, and then I believe we're going to be start doing Percy Jackson after that. But I think since we just read so little bit at night, you know, so it's going to take us a while to slow roll through that, thinking it'll be time for The Hobbit after that because he loves the movies. He enjoys the movies quite a bit, so I think it will actually be more approachable for him uh, than it would be just doing it his own way. Now, before I get into some of the paperback stuff here, um, I don't know if you guys count this as book collecting. I mean, I do. I feel like this is the way that we're all moving now. But I did get some digital books that I want to talk about here because it's you guys' fault. In that same poll that I was talking about earlier, the Malazan fans, uh, apparently the 10 very large books that there are that I have back there, not enough. No, not enough. I got to read all the Esselmont stuff and I got to read all the side stories and stuff. Well, I now have 23 uh, Malazan books on my Kindle if you count those originals. Uh, I had the original, uh, the Book of the Fallen, on here for uh, you know for a while now. I don't even know if you guys can see this, uh, but basically I have 23 books on here now, counting those. So 13 uh, side novels. Yeah, I think that's what Path to Ascendancy, the Carcanos trilogy, or something, something, some spinoff. I can't even think of what they're called. I actually wrote it down and then I forgot to look at it. Uh, the Tales of Bachelain and Corbal Brooch. Uh, the first couple of books in the, I think there's only two of them out. The Karkonos Trilogy, is that what I mentioned earlier? And then I hear that, that uh, Erickson is actually releasing like sequel books starting this year. So uh, obviously there's plenty to go there. So 2021 is going to be wild. Uh, I My goal is just to make it through the 10 very large books. But, you know, I had so many digital credits to use. I said, hey, why not? What if I really just eat up this series and I just can't get enough. It's nice to have those options there. Instead of trying to dig all those down on paperback to match the ones I have, why don't I just go ahead and get those digital versions? And that's what I went ahead and went with. Um, another series that's coming in 2021, I mentioned it briefly in that video, uh, is the Faithful and the Fallen series by John Gwynn. These white covers never show up in the light. I have heard such spectacular things about this series that when I got a good a deal on the on the this, the collection for the whole collection, I went ahead and jumped on it because its covers are just so cool for paperbacks. Earlier, I'm like, God, look at these! These are some meaty ass books, you know. But I I feel like nine to one, the feedback I hear on this series is just like this is the most underrated fantasy series going right now. Uh, I, I talked before about that reviewer on Goodreads that. If you pay attention to Goodreads and you read fantasy reviews, you know Petrick is usually the number one reviewer on all things fantasy. And he puts John Gwynn, this author, up there with Brandon Sanderson as the current best in the business right now. So that's high praise coming from a guy that I, my, my ideals usually align pretty well with his. Uh, but yeah, he said it's uh, Sanderson, John Gwynn, and Abercrombie are his three must-read authors right now. And I'm like, well, that's... Damn, you know, I'm a huge fan of Abercrombie. I love me some Sanderson's pretty much dominating my entire year right now. So I'm going to give it a, a go off of that alone. And like I said, it was like one price. Seriously, for all four of these books, it was basically like $8 more than just buying the first book on hardcover. So I was like, I'll just get the whole set. Why not? Why not? You know, while I still have the shelf space. And uh, that leads me to the behemoth at the end of this. This one requires just a little bit of explanation. There was one author besides Stephen King in the 90s that was just like automatic for me. I told you when I found all King stuff, I just devoured it. And well, uh, I, I read the first book by this gentleman when I was younger. It was the first science fiction I've ever read, actually. And um, that was The Andromeda Strain by Michael Crichton. 
but it, just like everyone else when Jurassic Park came out, I wanted to read the book. So I got Jurassic Park the book. And then much like King, I devoured everything that Crichton had read, or I'm sorry, everything that he had written up to that point. And just the whole year was spent with that. And all through the 90s, it was like anything that King or Crichton put out, boom, immediately straight to the top of my list. So I was the uh, I was that dorky kid in high school that everyone's got like, you know, paperback novels of just crummy stuff if they did any reading at all or a Walkman and I'm lugging around a two-ton brick two-ton brick of <laughs> two-ton brick <laughs> a two-ton brick of Michael Crichton and Stephen King and I think it was a god what was the book that came out was it Disclosure I think and Gerald's Game at the same time and I'm lugging both of those around that might be wrong on that I, I don't know that was a long time ago but I remember carrying both of those in my backpack and basically having to take my actual school books and put them in my locker so I could carry those two books with me. Uh, but that's what it was. But uh, yeah, this month I decided, you know, I loved Crichton so much. His books are relatively easy to find. It's not like a lot of these fantasy books where I had to really overpay to get some on a hardcover. I was able to track it down. A lot, of, a couple of them I had to actually cheat to find. Uh, and that was what? Congo Sphere and Eaters of the Dead I got in a collection. And this didn't have a dust jacket on it, so I got it for $2. I figured that's three amazing stories. Why not? Let's go ahead and do that. Uh, but also, like I said, Andromeda Strain was the first one that I ever, first science fiction book that I ever read. I found a copy of it in my brother's room uh, when I was younger, and I just ate it up. I loved it. Uh, Terminal Man and Great Train Robbery. Uh, this guy was brilliant, and I still can't believe he's not longer, no longer with us, right? Um, there's more. There's more. I can go on and on. I've read every one of these books. I love them. I love them so much. Uh, even bad movies aside, <laughs> he has really, really wonderful, wonderful books. Books that were ahead of their time that you don't even think about that were his. And yeah, this guy was just a genius, man. Everything he put out was like automatic. But he wasn't bound you know, to any one genre. He'd do a sci-fi book and then he'd do some kind of technological thriller in the next one or something about a virus or something. A drama, it didn't matter. The guy was able to do anything. Freaking pirate stories, man. I mean, no matter what this guy touched, it was gold. Can you see that? It was gold. Anything that he made from the 80s through his death in 2008 was wonderful. Timeline melted my brain when I was... I looked at, I looked at time travel... For the first time, outside of the rules set in Back to the Future, this one made me think so, so much. State of Fear. A lot of people don't talk about this one. It, God, I mean, you think about just his impact on pop culture at the time. and you, yeah, I'm realizing right now I've got to do a Why You Should Read on Michael Crichton. Because this guy was just a hit machine, man. Everything he touched was gold. And that isn't even just talking about his books. You know... It looks just like the Jurassic Park cover, but it's actually Dragon Teeth. You think about the impact that this guy had on our pop culture, not just because of Jurassic Park. Westworld. You know that show that you guys like on, on HBO? Westworld. Michael Crichton idea. ER. He created it. Michael Crichton was a wizard, and I feel like he is so unappreciated in hindsight. And I can't believe he's been dead for 12 years. I admit I haven't read any of his posthumous stuff because... I don't feel like it's his. I feel like it's other people just kind of writing under his name. Uh, but I, I've been into that when I got into the Christopher Tolkien stuff and I got into the, the Brian Herbert stuff for Dune. Uh, I, don't, I don't usually follow posthumous stuff because I don't really believe it's based off anybody's work. They're just using the name to sell something. But uh, yeah, when his, his death came in 2008, it just completely stunned me. Because I was like, this guy was one of my automatic authors and you didn't even hear that he was sick. And then he just passed away. It just it made it was just it was stunning. It was stunning, and that's when I really started to look around and think, my God, I've read a lot of his stories. So I got 17 books here in this month. Like I said, the there's some really good coupons for half price books that come around, and it's one of those where you know the more you buy, the more you're going to save. And I was able to find his books rather easily. I had to pay a, a little bit extra for this leather bound uh, Jurassic Park, and I, I of course I wanted to. I love this. The, the stained pages on the edge. This one actually has Lost World in it too. So I've got two copies of Lost World now, you know, in case you want to uh, read that, you know. <laughs> can always find a copy and a spare here. But uh, that was my crazy, crazy month. And I do think I want to talk about uh, Michael Crichton more and more 
in depth soon because uh, it just made me remember how much uh, I loved him as a writer and how much his stories really impacted me. And I know I'm horror fantasy sci-fi on this channel, but you know, I felt like King and Crichton could step outside of those genres and go to like true crime and things like that and drama, and I was still on board with it because they were just wonderful, wonderful storytellers. So uh, yeah, that's kind of a pitch job there for Michael Crichton. Like I said, I'll talk more in depth about him soon because uh, I think he is one of my 10 favorite writers of all time. He's amazing, and uh, I don't feel like enough people appreciate that. But when they start to actually look at the the books and, and the, the movies that have been made off of them and stuff, they you know what? He rivals Stephen King as maybe the worst film, book to film adaptation rate ever. <laughs> you know, just that there's so much of them, and you know, they have the occasional hit like a Jurassic Park, like a Shawshank, but everything else is usually pretty, pretty bad. You know, so I think that's why I always compare the two, just because, you know, that's that was my two favorite authors in the 90s. And uh, yeah, they were can't miss material. And much like how I still read everything King puts out, I'd still be reading everything Crichton puts out if he was still with us. But that's why I'm not touching the posthumous stuff. But guys, that was February. Uh, what did you guys pick up in February? Did you have anything really special that you got a hold of that you want to talk about? Drop in the comments. Let me know. If you're interested in any of these books, would you like to hear me talk about a, uh, a Why You Should Read on Michael Crichton? Please let me know. Drop in the comments and uh, let's talk about these things. I'll talk to you there.